the reason you're sent, the reason you're called, the reason you're anointed is to please the Lord. You are not in ministry to make a name for yourself. You are not in ministry so your handsome picture can be on a billboard. You are not in ministry to make money. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You are not in ministry so that women will dance after you and bow down to you. You're not in ministry so that your family will say, oh, what a great son we have. You're in ministry for one reason and one reason reason alone to approve by God to please the Lord to please God and him alone that's why Jesus said in Matthew 22 love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment and this is the first and greatest commandment for you and I as ministers On Monday, April 10th, 2017, a driver was sent to the Kumasi Central Market. The driver was sent with a truck loaded with mattresses uh, and was ordered to offload the mattresses at the market. And so the driver who was sent uh, drove the truck to the market to discharge his load. But as he started to pull near to the marketplace, a policeman tried to stop him. The truck was overloaded and the policeman ordered the driver, do not park here. But the driver paid the policeman no mind and simply skirted around the policeman and drove on down the road. As the overloaded truck drove down the road past the market, uh, some market women noticed that there were low-hanging electrical cables in the roadway. With the mattresses loaded high and the cables coming down low, it was obvious to the market woman that the truck could not pass. Stop! The market woman shouted, you will hit the cables! But the driver paid them no mind. I know how to drive better than you, he shouted. But sure enough, as the overloaded truck drove down the road, it got caught underneath the electrical cables. The cables came down, and in an instant, sparks began to fly. The mattresses caught fire, and soon the fire spread. A five-story building caught fire, and then shops and goods worth hundreds of thousands of dollars all caught fire. By the time the fire service had arrived, the truck had burnt to the ground, the mattresses were ashes, a five-story building was destroyed, and one defiant act of lawlessness had cost hundreds of thousands of dollars of goods to be lost and impacting countless lives. There's a powerful lesson for all of us in the tragic but true story of the Central Market Fire in Kumasi in 2017. You see, when men refuse to submit to authority, it's like a spark that quickly sets an inferno ablaze. When men refuse to be held accountable, it affects innocent lives all around. When men refuse to listen, disaster is not far behind. Simply put, whenever a man is sent, there are specific steps he must follow in order to succeed at being sent. The driver in Kumasi was sent. He had a vehicle to discharge his mattresses, but he couldn't succeed in his mission because he failed to follow the steps to succeed at being sent. And all of us here today are not exempt from this lesson. In fact, those of us sent by God need to learn this lesson more than anyone else. For you see, those of us who've been sent by God need to listen and learn. We who lead God's people must be led by God. You preach to others to obey. Do you obey? You preach to others to submit to me now. Do you submit to God? You disciple others. Are you a disciple? You tell others to pay their tithe. Do you pay your tithe? We all have a divine appointment. We're all sent by God to change this generation. Yet in order to be successful at your divine appointment, you must learn the secrets to be successful at being sent. In order to lead others, you have to Lead yourself. 
That's the truth we're going to explore in our sermon this morning entitled, How to Be Successful at Being Sent. Almighty and everlasting Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We submit to you now. We resist every work of darkness which would deceive us with vanity, with pride, with error and darkness. And we cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus. We ask your spirit to come and lighten our hearts and minds. Give us grace today. We are here for you. We have been sent by you. So teach us how to be successful at being saved sent. We thank you that at the end of the day, your name will be glorified and other lives will be impacted because we've listened and learned today. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. I invite you today to join your faith with mine. Put your hand on your chest and pray out loud after me. Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, to help us learn our truth for today, we printed sermon notes. These are free of charge. Go ahead and take yours out and follow along with me as we discover three truths uh, to be successful at being sent. Our scripture text for today is there at the top of your notes and on the screen ahead of you, taken from 2 Timothy 2.15. If you love Jesus Christ, if you're called by God and anointed with the Holy Ghost, I want you to read this out loud. Read it like you're preaching on a Sunday morning to crowds of multitudes. Are you ready? Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this famous passage written by Apostle Paul to his spiritual son, Timothy. But I believe there is more to this verse than what we have already learned and experienced. Here in these few words, the Apostle Paul gives his spiritual son the keys to success in ministry. He tells him how to receive approval from God. Paul's second letter to Timothy is unique unique in this way. Rather than focusing on doctrine, the second epistle to Timothy focuses on Timothy's personal lives. It gives him instruction on how to lead himself more than how to lead the church. In other words, uh, here we have insight into how the apostle Paul discipled his spiritual son, Timothy. Paul has sent Timothy out to serve the Lord, and he's giving him the keys uh, to being successful at being sent. And in his words, we can gain insight for our own lives and ministry today. So let's discover three truths uh, to be successful at being sent. And here's your first truth. Uh, To be successful at being sent, you have to understand your role in ministry. Put your hand on your chest and say, my role. Listen again to how the Apostle Paul begins this verse. Be diligent to present yourself. Tell your neighbor, be diligent to present yourself. And in that statement, we have an understanding that there is a role you must play. Paul is talking to Timothy, and Paul is talking to you and I today. There's something we must do to be effective. We must be diligent to present ourselves. Too often, men in ministry ignore the important role that they themselves play at being successful in ministry. Too often, we simply rely upon our calling or upon our anointing we have, and we expect the call and the anointing alone to make us successful. Now, do not misunderstand me. You must be called. You must be anointed. You cannot do any good thing in ministry if you don't have a call from God and anointing. That's why Hebrews 5, Four says, and no one can become a high priest simply because he wants such an honor. He must be, say it with me, called by God for this work, just as Aaron was. I remember when I was running a Bible school in Nigeria back in the 1980s. One young man came, applied for the school. When we interviewed him, we discovered that the reason he came to the school was not because God had called him, but because his uncle owned a church, and the uncle wanted him to come up and become a pastor to help him. He didn't have a call from God. He had a call from his uncle. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. 
And so you must be called. You must be anointed. It's a requirement to be sent. Uh, but the call from God is not the only requirement. The anointing from God is not the only requirement. There are things you must do. You must be diligent to present yourself approved to God. You have to work at developing yourself. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you today. You cannot be approved if you have never improved. Many young ministers err today thinking, I'm called, I have a vision, I had a dream, I'm anointed. But they don't want to pay the price to sacrifice or change or be sanctified. But consider great men of God in the Bible who were called and anointed, but they failed. Samson. Samson's call far exceeded your call. Before his mother conceived him in her womb, an angel appeared to the mother and said, you will have a son who will deliver my people. Did an angel appear to your mother before she conceived you? Hey, hey, right there. Samson was called, oh, tell your neighbor he was called. He had a powerful work, but he failed because he failed in his character. King Saul was called. King Saul was anointed by the greatest prophet of his day. Prophet Samuel came and poured one liter of anointing oil on his head. Hey! Did prophet Samuel pour anointing oil on your head? King Saul was called. But he failed because he refused to learn. He refused to lead himself. He never conformed to God's plan. Jesus himself called Judas Iscariot. Hey! Who called you? Your bishop? Your archbishop? Jesus himself called Judas. He invested in Judas for three years, and Judas failed. Today, nobody names their son Judas because he didn't improve himself. You can have the greatest call in the world. You can have the greatest anointing in the world. If you don't understand the role you play, you will not succeed. You must improve yourself. Look at the men of God who did great things, who succeeded in their ministry. They understood not just the calling, but also that they needed to develop themselves. Think about Joseph. He was called in a dream to lead his family and to impact the generation. Yet he went through persecution. He went through suffering. He went through trials. And he came out to change uh, and eventually when God had tested him he trusted him and elevated him think about Moses Moses was called by God from the burning bush but he had to undergo sanctification and purification he was hidden in obscurity he had to suffer the release of so many things upon himself and his family and yet he became one of the greatest leaders Jesus himself was called by the father and sent by the father but Jesus spent 30 years developing before he had three years of ministry. So my question to you today is this. Are you prepared to allow God to improve you so that he can approve you? Are you willing for the Lord to lead you through the refining process so that you can be conformed to his image, so that you can be a useful vessel in his hands? Yes or no? Today we live in the microwave generation. We want everything now. We want our answer to prayer now. We want our breakthrough now. We want our miracle now. We want to start a church in the morning and build the cathedral in the afternoon. We want to become a disciple today, an apostle overnight. Hey! No so. It doesn't work like that. Some young men receive a dream. They woke up with a dream. I don't know why they had a dream. It may be God. Maybe you ate bad kinke. I don't know. They had a dream. They saw themselves holding microphone. Say, hey, I'm called to preach. They have no education, no skill, no experience, no resources, but they jump up based on the dream, build some benches, and paint a signboard. International Global World Outreach. You have never left Greater Accra, and you have International Global World Outreach. Clap for yourself. Hey, tell your neighbor he's talking about you. But you cannot bypass God's process. You can't shortcut to success. You have to be 
diligent, the Bible says. You have to study God's word, spend time in preparation. You have to improve to be approved. If Jesus could spend 30 years preparing for three years of ministry, why can't you slow down and prepare yourself and allow time to grow and learn and be disciplined? There's no substitute. There's no shortcut. You can't put the Bible under your pillow at night and wake up theologically sound. You have to study. Hello. Oh, you don't like me. Oh, okay, bye. I'll, I'll go now. I've been preaching the gospel for 49 years. I'm older than Google. I'm older than Microsoft. I'm older than Apple. I'm older than Republic of Ghana. Hey! But I take time to listen and to learn. I still read books. I still listen to other men's sermons. I still attend conferences because you have to improve to be approved. You have to be committed to the process of change. A disciple is a lifelong learner. And to be successful at being sent, you must be able to willing to listen and to change and to learn. The problem we have today is we do not understand ministry. Most of us think ministry is a position. That's why we're chasing big titles. You see some men, they're called Archbishop, Reverend, Doctor, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor, Teacher. Hey! But ministry is not a position. Ministry is influence. This is what we learn from Jesus, Jesus leadership. He set an example. Listen to John 13. Since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Tell everybody is an example. Do as I have done to you. Jesus understood that ministry wasn't his title. It was his influence. Listen to Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 4.12. He said, be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. And when a minister sets an example, it makes an impact. When a minister sets an example, he or she is leading the way. What example are you setting in your church? I don't care how well you preach. I don't care how great you sing. I don't care about your ministry. What is your example? What is your influence through what you say and what you do? When you lead the way, you show others what to do. That's why Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 4, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. So ministry is influence. Influence sets an example, and influence leads the way. That's why you cannot disciple someone simply by teaching them. Discipleship is not the transfer of information. Discipleship is the transfer of life. Discipleship requires action. Access. When Jesus called his disciples to follow them, he said, you must come and be with me as I show you. And in order to raise up disciples, in order to be successful at being sent in your church, you've got to change so you can lead others. You've got to bring them in and give them access so they can see and hear and learn from what you do. God has designed your ministry to make an impact and you have to minister that impact through your example. As you minister an impact, it will be a direct proportion to your ability to influence others. And when you think about that, that's really good news because influence is something that every one of us can grow in our lives. You're not going to be successful because of the family you came from. You won't be successful in ministry because of your theological education. You won't be successful because of all the talents you have. You'll be successful when you increase your influence and develop yourself to make an impact. Amen. Don't get hung up on title. Focus on developing your life to be an influence. That's the lesson we can learn from the former U.S. president named Jimmy Carter. While in office, Carter was considered a mediocre president. He started out okay, but then economic problems came to the economy. And when economy came down, Carter went on television and seemed to blame the American people, and he lost influence. When protesters stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, Iran, Carter seemed confused. He didn't know what to do. The stalemate lasted for a year, and Carter lost influence. He had a title, 
He had a position. The most powerful man in the world, president of USA. Hey! But he lost influence through his failure to improve. So in 1980, he lost his re-election by a huge margin to Ronald Reagan. But Carter didn't give up. Though he never ran for office again, he didn't stop growing. He learned from his failure and set an example for others to follow. He devoted himself uh, to charitable work. He went around the world building houses for the poor through Habitat for Humanity. Today, he's one of the most respected former presidents in the U.S. In fact, in 2002, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his outstanding contributions. And here's what you need to learn from his story. His influence has increased even though his title has disappeared. He had a title without influence. Now he has influence without a title. And the world is better because of who he is and what he does. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. A leader is a learner. We see this truth in the Apostle Paul. During his years of successful ministry, he did great exploits. He planted churches around the globe. He preached the gospel to the lost. He healed the sick and raised the dead. And yet, he wrote most of the New Testament. Yet he says in Philippians 3, at the end of his life, near the end of his ministry, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. I dare the big, big bishops in this city to say that very word, I have not achieved it. Hey, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. This is the greatest apostle who ever lived. This is the greatest man who wrote most of the New Testament. Yet he says, I've not done it all. I've not accomplished. I've not achieved. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I'm still being sanctified. I'm still pressing forward. And Paul could say this, what about you? Tell your neighbor, what about you? So here's my advice to you this morning. Stop seeking a better position and position yourself to be a better leader. Thank you for those who clapped. For those who didn't, I'm praying for you right now. Lord, deliver them in Jesus' name. Because leaders develop by learning. Ministers develop by maturing. Those who are sent by God must be sanctified in order to succeed. The more you learn, the greater your capacity to lead. The more you mature, the greater influence you have and the higher leadership you have in the kingdom of God. The more you're sanctified, the more opportunities you will have to be sent. No matter who you are, no matter where you came from, no matter your pedigree or lack thereof, you can grow in influence as you improve to be approved. But failure to grow as a minister puts a lid on your ministry. Failure to mature and be sanctified means you cannot grow and you will not influence people. If you can't lead yourself, you have no right to lead anyone else. The smallest crowd you will ever lead is the most important. Lead yourself. And that brings us to our second step to be successful at being sent. To be successful at being sent, you have to understand your reason for ministry. Everybody say reason. So the first thing is you have to understand your role. You have a part to play. Second, you have to understand your reason. We pick this up as Apostle Paul continues. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Everybody say approved to God. So here's the summation in simple words of the purpose and reason for your ministry. The reason you're sent, the reason you're called, the reason you're anointed is to please the Lord. You are not in ministry to make a name for yourself. You are not in ministry so your handsome picture can be on a billboard. You are not in ministry to make money. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You are not in ministry so that women will dance after you and bow down to you. You're not in ministry so that your family will say, oh, what a great son we have. You're in ministry for one reason and one reason alone, to approve by God, to please the Lord. 
to please God and him alone. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And this is the first and greatest commandment for you and I as ministers. And it's the first and greatest commandment because it lays a foundation for being successful at being sent. There's nothing more important, nothing more central, nothing else we need to do than to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. For when you obey this commandment and love God supremely, you fulfill your purpose in life. You were not created to preach. You were created to love God. Preaching comes out of your love for God. You were not created to do miracle signs and wonders. You were created to love God, and all the answers to prayer come out of our love for God. You were not created to build a big ministry named after yourself that you will hand over to your son when you die. You were created to love God, and anything else you do comes from that. For Ephesians 1 says, God has told us his secret reason for sending Christ, a plan he decided on in mercy long ago, and this was his purpose. That when the time is ripe, he will gather us all together from wherever we are, in heaven or on earth, to be with him in Christ forever. Moreover, because of what Christ has done, we, what? We, what? What? We have become gifts to who? Gifts to who? Gifts to God that he delights in. For as part of God's sovereign plan, we were chosen from the beginning to be his, to belong to him. I have news for you. You are not a gift to your church. You're a gift to God. Some of you walk on this stage. You want the people to clap. I am a gift from God to you. Nonsense. You are a gift to God, that you belong to him. Then God has anointed me so I have a gift, so I can get rich and drive a car. You get excited. You want police to follow you with sirens blaring and the road to clear. You think you are a gift. Your gift is a gift to yourself. It's not a gift to you. It's a gift to God. And everything we have and everything we are is for one reason and one reason alone, to give our gift to God. He's the reason for your life. He's the center of everything. And everything in life, everything in ministry revolves around Jesus. When you realize you are not the center of the universe, then you will experience a Copernican revolution. Say what? What is a Copernican revolution? Let me tell you. Way back in 1543, there was a scientist and mathematician named Nicholas Copernicus. He lived in a time when everyone on earth thought that the earth was the center of the universe. Everyone believed the sun, the moon, and all the galaxies revolved around earth. The sun revolves around the earth. We are the center of the universe, people said. And it's not surprising they felt that way. In 1543, there were no cars, no trains, no buses, no airplanes, no rockets going to space. Man could only see himself, and he believed that he was the center of the universe. But Copernicus began to study the stars and the sun and the sky, and he came to a shocking conclusion. He discovered that the earth is not the center of the universe, that actually the earth revolves around the sun. And so in 1543, he wrote a book, uh, revolutionized the world's thinking. And as others studied his findings and studied through the telescopes, they discovered the earth was the one that was revolving around the sun, not the sun around the earth. It shook the world of science. It shook the world of academia and education. People were dumbfounded. And eventually the whole world came to the conclusion that the earth Earth is not the center of the universe. It was so impactful, it was called the Copernican Revolution. And the Copernican Revolution is still going on today. For you see, any time 
a man realizes he is not the center of the universe. Anytime a man realizes that life revolves around the Son, Jesus Christ, you experience a Copernican revolution. I had a Copernican revolution when I was 17. I believed in Jesus Christ. I went to church. I had been baptized, baptized. Oh, hey. But I wanted Jesus on my terms. I wanted to keep Jesus in my back pocket. When I went out to party with my friends and smoke and drink, I wanted Jesus hidden in my back. But if I was studying for exam or I got sick or in trouble, I wanted to be able to pull Jesus out to rescue me. Hey. When my friends were around, Jesus was hidden. When I went to church, Jesus came out. I wasn't following Jesus. I wanted Jesus to follow me. And some of you are not following Christ in your ministry. You're demanding that Jesus should follow you. You need a Copernican revolution. My revolution came when I discovered that I had to make a decision, follow Jesus or not. See, Jesus told me plainly what he tells all of us. It's all or nothing. Follow me or don't follow me. And to follow him means you go all in with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's what I did. I surrendered my life to Christ and said, I will go where you send me. I will say what you want me. If you tell me to keep quiet, I will keep quiet. Whatever you tell me, I am not the center of my life. Jesus Christ is the center. So what about you? Has Jesus become the center of your life? Or is there something else you have on the altar that you worship? Let me speak to pastors today because some pastors, your ministry has become your God. Your ministry is your idol. You're not worshiping Jesus. You're worshiping your ministry. If Jesus told you to put down the microphone, resign your position, and go to the prayer closet and spend the rest of your life praying, would you do it? Would you obey? Because if Jesus is the center, the reason for your ministry is to please him. You're a sent man, and you only do what you're told. And this not only impacts ministry, it impacts life. For Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that people can know you, the only true God, and that they can know Jesus Christ, the one you sent. In other words, God's purpose in creating you is to know him. God's main reason for creating you is to know him. God sent his son Jesus so that you could know him. God's calling on your life is that you can know him. You're not in ministry to make a name for yourself. You're not in ministry to get money. You're not in ministry to be popular. You are in ministry to please him and worship him. What's your purpose? You must know your reason to succeed at being sent. One time a man was walking downtown Oxford Street in Accra when he saw them building a mighty building. He didn't know what they were building, but he wanted to know. So he stopped and he asked the workers there. The first man was chiseling stone. And he said, please, what are you doing? The man said, can't you see? I'm chiseling stone, idiot. He went on to the second man. He said, please, what are you doing? The man said, I'm working to get bread to eat. I'm hungry. He went to the third man and said, please, what are you doing? The man said, oh, me? I'm building a mighty cathedral. The first man was focused on his task, what he was doing. The second man was focused on his reward, what he would get. But the third man was focused on his purpose, what he was building. So what are you focused on? Are you just focused on the task, how I can get people here? Are you just focused on the reward, how I can get more crowd with more time to get more money? Are you focused on your purpose to bring him glory, to know him, to love him, to be surrendered to him? For when you put the work of the Lord ahead of the Lord of the work, you've lost your focus. And we've got to get back today where we understand if Jesus is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. For Deuteronomy 10, 12 says, now Israel, this is what the Lord your God wants you to do. Respect the Lord your God and do what he has told you to do. Love him, serve the Lord your God with your whole being. And I declare to you today that God is calling you back to himself. He's calling you to know him. 
him. He's calling you to love him. He's calling you to make him the center of your life. You have a role to play. You have to understand your reason for being sent. And number three, to be successful at being sent, you have to aim for the right results. Listen to how Paul concludes this verse. In verse 15 he says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've been called to deliver a message. You've been called to obey the king. You've been called to do what the one who sent you told you to do. And you don't need to worry about your results. You don't need to be focused on your results. Uh, for the fact is the outcome is God's responsibility. Obedience is your responsibility. But I'm here to tell you today, if you will devote yourself to Christ, if you will understand your role and understand your reason and understand the right results that you're aiming for, God is going to bless you. He's going to lift you. He's going to make you successful in ministry. For the Bible says in Joshua 3, 5, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Understand first, you must consecrate yourself. Understand first, you must dedicate yourself. You must surrender yourself. When you make Jesus the Lord and the center of your life, you're now in a position for God to do amazing things. And God is going to do amazing things with those who are dedicated and those who are devoted and those who have Jesus at the center of your life. Will you be successful at being sent? That's why God admonishes us in Romans 6.13. Give yourselves completely to God since you've been given new life. And use your whole body as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. In other words, everything you have and everything you are belongs to him. After all, isn't that your reasonable service? But didn't Jesus wear the crown of thorns, they twisted the long spiked thorns and shoved it into his head as the blood flowed down his beard. Didn't he take the whip on his back? He was bruised and beaten till he bled. 39 times, a lead-tipped whip. Didn't he carry the cross up the hill? It was so heavy, he stumbled and his knees buckled. Didn't they lay him out on the cross and pound the nails into his hands? He made the iron that created the nails. He made the tree that gave the wood that gave the cross, and yet they hung him there, and he let them strip him naked in front of the whole world. Didn't he receive the nails in his hands and feet? He could have escaped. He could have called 10,000 angels. He created the tree and the nails, but he endured the agony and shame and he did it for you and me not that we will be popular not that we will be famous not that we will make money but so that the lamb that was slain would receive the reward of his suffering and in light of everything he's done shouldn't you give yourself completely to him for second corinthians says the love of christ controls us he died for all so that those who live would not continue to live for themselves. He died for them and was raised from death so that they would live for him. He died and rose so you would preach for him. He died and rose so you would pray for him. He died and rose so you would witness for him. He died and rose so that everything you do in ministry will be for him. And the right results are not the size of your crowd. The right results are not your followers on Facebook. The right results is hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. He did all this for us and more. He rose from the dead. He rescued us from the devil. And even now, there's nothing he won't do for you. Hasn't he given you life? Hasn't he answered your prayers? Hasn't he blessed you and strengthened you? Doesn't he care for us and love us and hear us? That's why Romans 12, 1 says, brothers and sisters, Mpacho, I beg you, Mpacho, I beg you, I beg you, brothers and sisters, listen to me, Mpacho, I beg you, I beg you. In view of all we have just shared about God's compassion, I encourage you, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, dedicated to God and pleasing Him. <clears throat> 
for the right result is pleasing Him. Don't worry about the size of your crowd or the size of your offering. Never mind who follows you on Facebook or YouTube. Are you pleasing Him? Offer yourselves completely to Him. For the right result is pleasing Him. One time there was a brother who had a dream. In the dream, an angel came and took him in the spirit to a mighty church cathedral. Hey, it was beautiful. Stained glass window, steel auditorium, huge balcony. And the crowd had packed the place. But there was something strange. As the singers were singing, as the preacher was preaching, the brother in the dream couldn't hear anything. Pata, pata, finish. Nothing. So he asked the angel, ah, I see people singing, but I don't hear music. I see the preacher preaching. I don't hear anything. Why? Then the angel said, oh, you're seeing this church from heaven's viewpoint. And in heaven, the only sound made, the only noise heard in heaven are from the things that are done out of love for Christ. Hey. But wait, these people are worshiping. Why is there no sound in heaven? Then the brother pointed to the angel. There was a sister up there. She was dancing. Hey, Jaira, Jaira, Jaira. He said, isn't she worshiping God? The angel said, eh. She's just there to show off her dress, her shoes, and her nails. Then the brother said, ah, but what about the keyboard? He's playing. Listen to him playing. So anointed, playing, playing. Isn't he playing to worship God? The angel said, don't mind him. He's just praying, playing for his job money. Bless you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Then the brother was confused. He said, but what about the preacher? He's sweating. He's preaching one hour. He's preaching. The angel said, oh, he's preaching to become popular and well-known. The man began to panic. He said, well, wait, in this crowd, is there no one, not one brother, not one sister, is there no one who's doing worship out of love for Christ? What about that woman in the back? She was praying, praying. The angel said, don't mind her. She's praying to kill her enemies. And a day. What about that man over there standing, looking so fine? Oh, he just came to find a wife. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. <laughs> the brother began to shout, God, in a crowd like this, the singers, the worship, the instrumental, is there no one here for Jesus? Then he heard a sound. And he looked and saw a little child in the back kneeling down. The child was praying and he heard his voice cry out, Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. The only sound from that mighty church was a little child worshiping God in humility. So let me ask you a question today. If the only noise coming from your life was what you did out of love for Jesus, how much noise would your life make? If the only noise coming from your church was the sound of people in complete surrender to Jesus, how much sound would come from your church? I don't know about you, but I want my life to make some noise. I want my ministry to make noise in heaven. I want my church and my people and my pastors to resound and echo through the halls of heaven, to join the heavenly chorus singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I want everything I do and everything I say and everything I am to bring him glory and to bring him praise. For that's why I exist. That's why I'm here. That's why I have been sent. You can be successful at being sent. First, understand your role. You must improve to be approved. Second, clarify your reason. Make a commitment to Jesus and Jesus alone. 
For true success in ministry comes when he is the center of all we do. And third, aim for the right results. Successful ministry comes when you're aiming for Jesus. That's my prayer for you. May you be more committed to learning and growing and sanctifying your life than ever. May you be more dedicated to Jesus and Jesus alone. May you see great results in ministry as you please him. May you be successful at being sent. Father, hear our prayer today. We humble ourselves before you. We've gathered for this half day to improve that we might be approved. Come and move upon us first and foremost by bringing us back to complete surrender to you. Help us, Lord, to lay aside every wrong motive, every wrong aim, every wrong desire as we come in surrender to you. Let us be successful at being sent. In Jesus' name, amen.